it is getting harder and harder to afford a place to live in Massachusetts. If you're looking to buy real estate company, Point Two says more than half of all listings in Boston proper are over a million dollars. Only four other cities also passed that mark, and they all happen to be in California. For renters, the picture isn't any better with some of the most expensive rental prices in the country, according to data from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the most expensive fair market rate for a one-bedroom of any state. State lawmakers have filed dozens of bills aimed at bringing prices down. Earlier this week, the legislature's Joint Committee on Housing held a hearing on nearly 20 of them. I'm joined now by the committee's Senate co-chair, State Senator Lydia Edwards, and by Caitlin Golden, Director of Public Policy for the Massachusetts Housing and Shelter Alliance. Thank you both for being here. Senator Edwards, I know that you and your colleagues are holding several hearings on matters involving housing right now. This one was focused on affordability. And I'm wondering, when you and your colleagues think about that issue, are you focused on the ability of the lowest income, most economically vulnerable residents of the state to get housing? Or is affordability something that applies to not just them, but people in maybe the middle class, even in some cases, the upper middle class as well? Um, it's an issue that used to be specifically about the folks who are the most vulnerable. But today, the way the prices are going, and it is now something that impacts our working class, middle class, and all income levels. Uh, it's a matter of being not just being able to afford your first apartment, but being able to one day own a home. So being able to think about affordability in terms of that entire spectrum of economic um, economics, uh, people trying to buy their first home aren't necessarily the most vulnerable, but in many cases, they're locked out of the locked out of the system right now. And I think, tell me if I've got this right, I believe the Mass Budget and Policy Center put out a, a study within the last week or two saying that most of the people moving out of Massachusetts, and we have this drain going on right now, it's mostly not high wage earners, right, but people earning, I believe, under $200,000? Correct. Many people are finding that they cannot take up roots in Massachusetts like they used to. Graduating from college, graduating from graduate school, getting your first job, and that's usually where you can get your starter home or your starter apartment, and they are out of reach. In many cases, they are leaving to start someplace else, and that's a huge loss to the state. Senator, I want to ask you about the diagnosis of this problem that Governor Healy offered in her inaugural speech earlier this year. I'm curious about whether you agree with the way she sized it up. Let's take a look at what she had to say back in January. The cost of housing is out of control for too many because we simply don't have enough of it. If we want Massachusetts to be a home for all, we need to build more places to live. And we need to make sure those homes are within reach. Senator Edwards, does that way of conceptualizing the problem square with your own, or do you part ways with the governor in terms of how you understand this issue? Um, quite to the contrary. I do not part ways with the governor. I think she has demonstrated the ability to see the issue on many fronts, not just build more housing, but create a whole department dedicated to housing people all people, uh, and making sure that folks who have disabilities, who have families, and so on and so forth, are part of that conversation. Where I would say that we, if there is any difference, or I'm finishing the sentence, it's we need to build more housing at various income levels and be conscious about that. What is the average income in Boston is totally different than Springfield, is different than Fitchburg. Yeah. And you need to build for the communities that you're in to house the people who are living there. Uh, Caitlin Golden, your organization, tell me if I've got this right, is focused on ending homelessness for unaccompanied adults, adults who do not live with other people, do not live with children. How big is that problem right now in Massachusetts for that population? It's a big problem. As you know, as you heard and as the senator mentioned, it's we're in a housing crisis right now for all income levels, but that particularly impacts the most vulnerable. So people who are experiencing homelessness, many of whom may have complex behavioral health, um, medical issues that they're facing. Uh, we have preliminary numbers for the January 2023 point in time count, counting people who are experiencing homelessness. And those preliminary numbers are showing an increase of about 23% of unsheltered homelessness. So that means people living in encampments and on the streets. So we're clearly not going in the right direction on that, and we really need to, to make some change. Is that an increase of 23% compared to this point in time last year? Last year, That's yes. That's an enormous increase. And do you have a sense of what the total 
size of that population might be right now? Are we talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? So for the, the January 2022 point in time count, which is what we have the most uh, fullest numbers on, it was around 15,000 people experiencing homelessness in Massachusetts, and of that, around 5,000 who are unaccompanied adults. Uh, one of the points you raised, and I believe, tell me if I've got this right too, you testified to the Senator's Committee last month? That's correct. Correct, at a different hearing. One of the points that you raised in your testimony that I was kind of flabbergasted by is that at this point in time, there is no state forecast looking ahead, projecting what the total number of people who are homeless, unaccompanied homeless, other types of homeless people, what, what the total number is going to be on any given year moving forward and what the shelter demand is going to be. Is that correct? That's correct. We're, we're at a point right now where we are making progress, and the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities is making progress on getting together the data around people experiencing homelessness, but we really need a plan. We need benchmarks. We need to be able to forecast what the need is for shelter and for permanent housing across the state. Why is it, and I'm going to show my naivete here, and Caitlin, you can answer, Senator, you can answer, but why would it be that that sort of plan wouldn't have been created? Because when I saw that piece of your testimony, again, my jaw kind of dropped. I just, I think, would have assumed that a plan like that would have been in place. Yeah, and I think there have been smaller plans, more local plans across the state, and various communities have, have worked on local planning. I think that um, we're in a position in the state where we have 12 different continuums of care, so 12 different regional entities uh, who are working on addressing homelessness, all with different data systems. And mm -hmm. so it's a project to get everyone's data feeding to the right place and making sure we're using that data effectively to plan. Uh, Representative Higgins and Senator Feeney have filed a bill to ask the Executive House, Office of Housing and Livable, Com Livable Communities to do just that, to make a plan about future shelter need, future housing need, and really prioritize permanent housing and non-congregate shelter. Senator Edwards, I think I might have seen you nodding out of the corner of my eye. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what you were nodding at? Uh, yeah, no. I, before I was senator, before I was city council, I worked with the Office of Housing Stability. Uh, in the city of Boston, and so dealing with housing crisis. And what we notice is that it is not any one city or any one community's conversation. It can't just be Boston that is dealing with this because so many of the people who were uh, unsheltered were not from Boston, but in Boston. Mm -hmm. And so it was a constant conversation with different different resources, different understanding of homelessness, homelessness, excuse me, different understanding of whether they should even deal with it. Some cities and towns do not want to acknowledge that they have a problem. And so it is all of those different headspaces that then result in the lack of planning, the lack of cohesive understanding that we all have to do something. And it, it ends up with us finally starting to have this conversation. So I'm nodding because the disjointed conversation that we've had for decades is what led to this, has led to this crisis moment. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Senator, I know, again, that you are in the midst of, of hearings on this very big and very thorny issue. Uh, I said to the two of you before we got rolling here that, that I realized when I was getting questions ready that we really need like four or five hours to talk through this stuff as opposed to the 15 minutes that we have here. Um, that being said, are there any big ideas that are coming up again and again in the hearings that you're holding, in the bills that are crossing your desk, that you think are likely to be reflected in some way, shape, or form with whatever or in whatever action the legislature ends up taking on housing in this session? Well, the big action that I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm watching both the House and Senate have pushed forward for housing production incentives, uh, such as HDIP, which is a tax incentive to local municipalities, and really pumping in a lot of money uh, to assure that there's, a, there's an actual backlog of units to be built. Um, one of the criticisms is that a lot of those units are market rate. Um, but if the city and town has a local IDP or inclusionary zoning that requires affordable housing, they'll be part of that as well. Mm -hmm. But the point is, uh, one of the biggest things that I can say we can all agree on is to produce more units. So that is something that I think I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see the House and Senate have similar language and also see that the governor has led on that as well. Other protections and other things that I'm, I'm watching, again, the House, the Senate, and the governor kind of move on is assuring what we need to do more than anything is keep people in the homes that they have. You, we need to invest in public housing in a, in a huge infrastructure way to assure that, you know, people don't, the best way to keep people out of a shelter system is to keep them in the homes that they have. And so revamping and looking at the shelter system, also um, recommitting. Um, 
decommissioning certain colleges, uh, college dorms, and looking at places where we can put people uh, that are already built uh, is huge. And finally, I think the biggest chorus is really making sure that the law that we pass, the MBTA zoning law, that that is robust and enforceable and getting cities and towns to to again, contribute to building housing. In terms of other policies, there's a lot of tenant protections that I think are very much a, a, something that people are looking at, including eviction ceiling, including opportunity to purchase. There are a lot of really good things that are still formulating, formula, I guess we're still working on in terms of having hearings and conversations. But what I see is a collective excitement and money and, uh, and energy around getting more units out there. Caitlin, one of the themes that seemed to me to be a, a continuum in the hearing that the senator and her colleagues held this week was the idea that the affordability issue impacts some groups more than others disproportionately, and that solutions, when it comes to finding housing for those groups, solutions need to be really tailored specifically to their particular needs. And one of the groups that came up throughout the course of this most recent hearing was disabled individuals. For the people that, that you work with, on a regular basis. To what extent do disabled individuals, or people living with disabilities, comprise a big chunk of that population? Yeah, working with people who are have experienced particularly chronic homelessness, long-term homelessness, having disabling conditions such as medical issues, behavioral health issues, um, those challenges um, need support. And a housing response for that population needs to involve supportive housing, which is putting someone into housing and providing the wraparound supports, behavioral health, medical supports, in order to help them stay in that housing. It's, it's called housing first, the idea that someone doesn't have to deserve housing. Right, which we heard a lot about in connection with the ongoing situation at Mass and Cass, right. and I know Mayor Wu is, is trying to do that. I should ask you, because, and we're, we're talking about a whole, this just shows how big the, the problem is. We're talking about a bunch of different types of housing here, from market rate to affordable new housing to existing housing to shelter housing that mm -hmm. you'd like to see built. Do you have a sense, Caitlin, of how much it would cost or how much it, it might cost to build congregate and non-congregate, more private housing for homeless individuals in the state and get them housed in a housing first model? Like what, what sort of investment? Yeah, would that well, require? so what I can say is we've talked about, and I think there's general agreement that Massachusetts is a short around 200,000 units that need to be created by 2030. And of that, we're, I think we'd say around 10,000 of that need to be supportive housing. And the thing about supportive housing is that it's an investment that is actually very cost effective. So once you are putting someone in supportive housing, there are significant decreases in Medicaid costs. So uh, emergency care, acute care. And so what we're finding is there's actually savings that result from putting people in housing. And so you need to have funding models that are flexible funding models that can provide operating, service, and capital dollars to build the supportive housing. And then that really ends up saving the state money. And do those models exist at this point in time? They do. So we have it, but what we really need is to bring to scale. Uh, Representative Moschino and Senator Crichton have filed a bill to create a flexible supportive housing pool um, subsidy program. And the idea is how do we really scale up? It's very difficult to create supportive housing. Providers end up going to multiple different sources of funding trying to cobble together a project. And what we need is flexible, intentional funding that really brings the model to scale. Senator Edwards, you mentioned the MBTA communities law uh, a couple minutes ago, and that was actually something I wanted to ask you about, as you know much better than me. That law, which was one of the biggest ideas to come out of the Baker administration and the legislature under former Governor Baker, that law has elicited some pushback from some communities that seem to not want to go along with the terms it laid down. Has that pushback made any of your colleagues in the legislature leery of trying to push communities harder on this front because obviously you know people are sensitive to local concerns and if you have residents saying we you know we don't like what this is doing we don't, we don't want to go along with it i would imagine that it could make some legislators apprehensive is it um, it, it could but i think by having it be the law it has really uh, provided whatever cover a lot of my colleagues may need. It, it's the law. You have to comply with it. The attorney general has made clear that she is also willing to help lend uh, a shoulder into making sure that some cities and towns also comply with it. For many of my colleagues and for many local elected officials, this was the this was the breath of fresh air that they needed to turn to their local select boards or zoning commissions and say, it's not an option anymore. You have to build. They needed this extra push that 
is um, they, they, they lowered the barrier for being able to afford housing from two thirds to simple majority, uh, excuse me, to be able to approve housing. Uh, these were the pushes that a lot of people needed it and unfortunately needed to come top down to get it done. So in many cases, I think a lot of my colleagues uh, saw this as a breath of fresh air so they can turn around and say, listen, here's an incentive with HDIB and tax um, incentives to make it actually cost worthy for folks to invest in your city and town. Here are other ways in which we can do, you know, multi-use zoning. It's really been what a lot of cities and towns have been craving for is this opportunity to amplify that we need more housing everywhere. I should ask uh, one more question. I'd be remiss if I didn't before I let both of you go. Senator Edwards, what's the state right now of the rent control or rent stabilization conversation at Beacon Hill? The conversation is scheduled, I think, for October 30th. So we will have a housing, it'll be part of the many bills that we have that day as well, uh, where I think the conversation will really kick off. There'll be a massive amount of wonderful advocates on both sides coming in. Uh, they have come in already. Uh, the advocates uh, for, for rent control and rate stabilization have been to the state house in many cases, really emphasizing the sense of urgency that the rents are not affordable and they're not getting more affordable with the system that we have right now. And so there will come in and we will hear, by then I'm hearing we might have other home rule petitions. Boston is the only one right now. We might have other cities and towns also pushing through their own version of rent stabilization. And then we will have that collective conversation and it'll go through the same process that all the other bills do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Caitlin Golden, you get the last question. Really quickly, what's the best thing for the people you work with that the legislature could do in this uh, in this session? Investing in flexible funding for permanent supportive housing. That's, that's really what we need. We need to scale up our supportive housing and have it be efficiently funded, flexibly funded. All right, Caitlin Golden, Senator Lydia Edwards, thank you both for being here. Thank you.